Hi, this is Amr Abdul Gawad from Texas Tech El Paso. We're going today to give the second lecture in the series of pediatric fractures for pediatrician. What is the objectives of this lecture? In the lecture before, we discussed the general aspects of pediatric fracture. In this lecture, we're going to have three more objectives. The first one is management of common pediatric fractures. The second one is how to differentiate between pediatric fractures that can be referred to the office from those who needs urgent referral. And the third one is identifying the most common missed condition in the ER. Now, let's start with common pediatric fracture. Clavicle fracture. Clavicle fracture are one of the most common fractures in children. The child presents with pain, swelling, and deformity over the affected clavicle after falling on an outstretched hand. X-rays will show the fracture. As you see in this case, there is a complete fracture of the clavicle with separation of the fracture ends. Other X-rays may show a non-displaced fracture or minimally displaced fracture. What is the management for the fractured clavicle? First, you have to examine the child. As we said in the general management, you have to examine the neurovascular bundle, making sure that it's intact, keeping in mind that the brachial plexus is very close to the clavicle and it may be injured in the same trauma. Most of the fractured clavicle can be managed with the arm sling for comfort. The child can put his arm in the arm sling and then once he feels more comfortable, he can take that arm sling off. But you have to keep in mind that you have to warn the family that healing will be with a callus of bone that, or that may be unsightly, especially for females. It has been found that arm sling gives the same result as the figure of eight bandage uh, without having the cumbersome of putting the figure of eight bandage. So most people now prefer the arm sling over the figure of eight. What is the indications for referral for orthopedic surgeon? Not all cases of a clavicle fractures need to be referred to orthopedic surgeon. Well, some of the indications for referral of a clavicle fracture is open fractures, fractures associated with the neurovascular injuries, or fractures with the fracture entending the skin, as you can see in this picture, uh, or markedly displaced or shortened fractures. I would also recommend that fractured clavicle in adolescent patients be referred because some of these patients may need surgery. Proximal humerus fracture. What is the clinical presentation for proximal humerus fracture? It is pain, swelling, and deformity related to the affected shoulder. Radiographs will show the fracture as you see in this case. What is the management of proximal humerus fracture? Remember that 80% of the growth of the humerus comes from the proximal humerus. That gives lots of healing potential and remodeling potential of the proximal humerus fracture. Remodeling means that if the fracture is angulated or displaced with remaining growth, it will uh, become back as a straight line. So most of these cases can be treated in a sling. It means that the child can put his arm in a sling and once he feels comfortable, he can take his arm out of the sling. What is the indication of an orthopedic referral for cases of proximal humerus fracture? First, displaced fracture in adolescent. Remember, adolescent has um, less growth remaining than uh, children, so their remodeling is less. So if there is a displaced fracture in adolescent, it should be referred for an orthopedic surgeon for possible intervention. Sulter Harris injur injuries of the proximal humerus. If you, I want you to see this x-ray. Uh, look to the x um, uh, proximal humerus on the left side. Here is the epiphysis. It lies over the metaphysis. If you see on the right side, you don't see the same picture. The epiphysis is here. It's away from the metaphysis. This is actually a fracture that happened through the growth plate here with separation of the um, uh, uh, with part of the metaphysis, so it's a Sulter Harris uh, too. The third indication for um, a referral for orthopedic um, the surgeon is a proximal humerus fracture that happens on a simple bone cyst. If you see this x rays, there is a cyst here in the proximal humerus. That's not the normal shape of a proximal humerus. There is an empty area here, uh, or what we call osteolytic lesion, and there is a small fracture in this area here up. Fractures um, which happen with a simple bone cyst should be referred for an humeral shaft fracture. The clinical presentation for a humeral shaft fracture is pain, swelling, and deformity of the affected arm. Remember, you have to do a good neurological exam of this child because the radial nerve comes very close to the humeral shaft and it may be affected with the injury or with the fracture ends.
This is a um, clinical picture for a child with a radial nerve palsy. He has a condition called wrist drop. It means that he's not able to raise his wrist up because of his radial nerve palsy. Radiographs will show the fracture. This is an X-ray of the arm showing a complete, a complete fracture of the humeral shaft with separation of the fracture ends. And the management should be orthopedic referral. Remember that most of the children with a humeral shaft fracture can be managed non-operatively. However, few of these patients may need surgical interference. Let's discuss now elbow fractures. Elbow fractures are very common in children. The commonest elbow fracture to happen in children is the supracondylar fracture of the humerus, followed by lateral condyle fracture. Remember, these two represent more than 90% of elbow fractures. Less common fractures of the elbow in children are medial epicondyle fractures, olecranon fractures, and radial head fractures. Supracondylar fracture of the humerus. This is the commonest fracture uh, of the elbow. It represents about 60 to 70% of elbow fractures in children. It is more common in boys, and it usually happens between the age of 5 to 7 years old. Remember, this fracture can be associated with many complications. That's why we need to study this fracture very good and be acquainted with it. The clinical presentation will be pain, swelling, and deformity. This is a clinical picture of a 7-year-old girl that presented to the emergency department after falling on an outstretched hand. If you see here, there is obvious deformity and swelling of the elbow. And if you look anteriorly, uh, there is a contusion of the anterior part of the elbow. Neurovascular exam is extremely important in cases of supracondylar fracture of the humerus. Uh, if there is absent pulse on the affected extremity, that's an urgent uh, case and urgent consultation should be done. Um, nerve injury is, um, is common also with the supracondylar fracture of the humerus. Good assessment of all nerves should be done. Uh, the injury can happen to the ulnar nerve, radial nerve, median nerve, or a branch of the median nerve called the anterior interosseous nerve. And actually, the anterior interosseous nerve is the most commonly affected nerve uh, in cases of supracondylar fracture of the humerus. Um, how to assess for the anterior interosseous nerve? You ask the child to make, uh, to make the okay sign. He won't be able to do a, com a circle with his hand. Um, he will actually has to extend his uh, DIP, the distal interphalangeal joint, of the index because he's not able to flex that joint. Radiographs of the supracondylar fractures of the humerus. According to the radiographs, there is three types of um, uh, supracondylar fracture of the humerus. Type 1 is which is the non-displaced. Uh, if you see here, there is a non-displaced fracture of the humerus. In the lateral view, you can see what is called the posterior fat pad sign. It means that there is a ra some radiolucency behind the elbow. I want you to look closely to this x-ray, look closely to this line. This represents blood in the joint, which is most commonly happens with the supracondylar fracture of the humerus. So this is a type 1 supracondylar fracture of the humerus. Type 2 is angulated. So in the AP view, there you can see the fracture here. In the lateral view, there is angulation of the fracture. Type 3 is a complete fracture with separation of the uh, fracture ends. If you see the lateral view here, uh, see how much displacement happened in this fracture. What is the management of the supracondylar fracture of the humerus? Orthopedic referral is always needed in any case of a supracondylar um, fracture of the humerus because there is possible uh, surgical intervention. Type 1 does not need surgical intervention. It can be managed with a splint. Uh, however, uh, type, uh, some of type 2s and type 3 needs uh, closed reduction and percutaneous pinning. This is the x-ray that we saw in the previous child for a type 3. And what we did is we brought the patient to the um, uh, uh, operating room and we did closed reduction. We didn't have to open the skin. And then using the C-arm in the um, operating room, uh, we pass some uh, metals, it's called the key wires, uh, to fix this fracture. Uh, if there is an absent pulse the, or if there is a suspicion uh, of compartment syndrome, you need to do urgent orthopedic uh, referral. What are the complications of the supracondylar fractures of the humerus? As we said before, neurovascular injuries, these are common. When you see any child with a supracondylar fracture humerus, especially a displaced one, you have to assess the neurovascular bundle very good and make sure that the child has good pulses and all the nerves are working. 
Malunion, malunion means the healing in a deformed position. Supracondylar fractures of the humerus are associated with very characteristic deformity. When they develop malunion, it's called cubitus verus. This is a child who had a supracondylar fractures, uh, supracondylar fracture of his left elbow a few years ago. If you see, he has a cubitus verus deformity. It means that the forearm is pointing inward, um, and this is a characteristic deformity that happens uh, after supracondylar fracture humerus if they develop malunion. Compartment syndrome also sometimes can happen with displaced supracondylar fracture humerus. So if there is a case of a displaced supracondylar fracture uh, of the humerus, you have to make sure that this child does not have compartment syndrome. If the compartment syndrome it is not released, the child will develop something called Volkmann contracture. It means he developed contractures of the long flexors of the fingers, as you can see in this picture. Lateral condyle fractures, this is the second common fracture uh, of the elbow. It's about 10% uh, of the fractures of the elbow. Uh, the clinical presentation, um, the radiographs will show the fracture of the lateral condyle. As you see in this picture, uh, this is the fracture here. It goes all the way to the joint. The other view will show you the fracture uh, better. This is a piece of the bone here with the associated uh, cartilage. What is the management of the lateral condyle of the humerus? Uh, all lateral condyle as supracondylar fracture should have an orthopedic referral. Uh, and um, the orthopedic surgeon, if it's non-displaced, he will put uh, apply a splint. If it's displaced, he will have to do a surgery for internal fixation. So if you see, this is an X-ray here of a lateral condyle. If you look closely here, uh, this is a piece of the bone um, that had been separated. You can see it much clearer here in the oblique view. And this um, the fracture needed open reduction and internal fixation with key wires. So the complications of lateral condyle fractures, non-union is the most common complication that can happen after lateral condyle fractures. It means that the lateral condyle piece does not heal with the rest of the humerus. This will result in a deformity that is called cubitus vulgus. Cubitus vulgus means that the elbow and the forearm are pointing outward. If you compare the right side to the left side of the elbow of this man, you will notice that this patient has a cubitus vulgus due to an old injury of his lateral condyle that was not fixed. So this is his x-rays. It shows obviously here the non-union. And the non-union will lead to the deformity that we said it's the cubitus vulgus. Because the ulnar nerve is on the medial side of the elbow, cubitus vulgus deformity will cause a stretch of this nerve. And will it leads to something called tardy ulnar nerve palsy. So this patient is not able to extend uh, the um, fifth and the fourth finger due to uh, palsy of his ulnar nerve with the resultant uh, cl uh, partial claw hand deformity. Medial epicondyle fracture, there is two types of medial epicondyle fracture. The first one is a stress fracture and the second one is acute fracture. Stress fracture happens because the medial epicondyle is attached to the medial collateral ligament and this ligament is subjected to stress with the throwing. So children which play games like baseball have repeated stresses on this piece of bone that may result in a stress fracture. Acute fracture can happen with acute trauma and it may be associated with dislocation of the elbow. Management of this fracture is always orthopedic referral. This is an example of medial epicondyle fracture with elbow dislocation. This is a child who fell on an outstretched hand. He presented with elbow dislocation. If you see, here is the, uh, his distal humerus. Here is the proximal radius and proximal ulna. So closed reduction was obtained. If you see, this is the AP after closed reduction. Here is the lateral. You can see that the distal humerus is incongruent with the proximal uh, ulna. And there is a small piece of bone here. Compare this to the contralateral side, you will see the difference. So this is an indication that this piece is the medial epicondyle and it went into the joint with reduction. So open reduction had to be done. The piece was pulled from the joint and was fixed with two screws. And if you see now, there is a congruent reduction between the distal humerus and the proximal ulna. Radial neck fractures. Radial neck fracture will present as uh, all other fractures with pain, swelling, and deformity of the affected elbow. 
The, uh, the x-rays will show the fracture. If you see here is a, a case of a radial neck fracture, uh, there is marked angulation in this fracture, and there is also some subluxation of the proximal uh, ulna with the distal humerus. What is the management of radial neck fractures? If there is minimal angulation of, that, of the radial neck, uh, the child is treated with a sling for comfort, and he can take the sling off once he feels more comfortable. If the angulation is marked, it has to be referred for an orthopedic surgeon uh, for uh, reduction and fixation. This is the case that is presented here. Uh, closed reduction was obtained and fixation with two key wires. You, see, you will see that uh, here the angulation had been correct. Let's talk now about fracture of both bones of the forearm. This is one of the common fractures that happen in children and usually happen due to falling on outstretched hand. The clinical presentation, the patient will present with pain, swelling, and deformity of the affected forearm. X-rays will show the fracture. In this X-ray, you can see the fracture of the radius and the ulna with the, with the angulation. The AP also will show the fracture. Management, uh, management of both bone forearm requires orthopedic referral. It will be either closed reduction versus open reduction. And with open reduction, the fixation can be with what we call flexible nail, which is an implant that go inside the bone or with plate and screws. Fractures of the distal radius and ulna. This is one of the commonest fractures that affect children. And the clinical presentation will usually be pain, swelling, and deformity after falling on outstretched hand. And the x-rays will show different types of uh, distal radius and ulna fracture. This is one of the common type of distal radius uh, fractures called torus fracture. We discussed that in the general um, the discussion of fractures, and we discussed that this type of fracture does not need orthopedic referral. It's a very stable fracture in which only one side will uh, break, the other side will be normal. The other type of distal radius fracture, and this is a green stick fracture. Also, we discussed this in the general management of fracture. If you see, there is an angulation of the radius with no displacement. If you look closely, actually, there is a torus or buckle fracture of the ulna. The next type of the fracture is the complete fracture. If you see, this is one end of the distal radius. Here is the other end. There is complete displacement uh, of the distal radius here. And the th uh, fourth type is the Sulter Harris injury or the uh, physis injury or a growth plate injury. The fracture went through the growth plate. There is displacement of the uh, epiphysis with part of the metaphysis. So this is actually a type 2 Sulter Harris injury, uh, the commonest type of Sulter Harris injuries. What is the management for distal radius and ulna fracture? As we said, torus fracture, the, these don't need orthopedic referral. Splint or a brace can be applied for comfort. Angulated or displaced fracture, this needs orthopedic referral for most probably closed reduction and casting in most cases. The Sulter Harris injuries, these um, should be referred to orthopedic surgeon as soon as possible uh, because Sulter Harris injuries heal very quick and it's better to get them to the orthopedic surgeon before they heal in a deformed position. Now let's discuss Galeazzi and Montague fracture dislocation. Galeazzi fracture dislocation, in which you have a fracture only of the distal radius with dislocation of the distal radio ulnar joint. If you see this picture, both radius and ulna should be overlying each other in the lateral view. They are not overlying each other in this case with a fracture of only the distal radius. So this is considered fra Galeazzi fracture dislocation. This needs orthopedic referral. So the, this case was referred for the orthopedic surgeon, and if you see here, closed reduction was obtained. Once closed reduction was obtained, the radius and the ulna now are overlapping. Montague fracture dislocation is fracture of the ulna with dislocation of the proximal radio ulnar joint. So if you see this x-ray, there is a fracture of the ulna here, and the proximal radio ulnar joint is dislocated. How can you diagnose this? You can, if you draw a line from the radius and the radial head, this line should normally bisect the capitellum, which is the distal part of the humerus. In this case, you see it is anterior to the capitellum. And this is the AP view. You can see also that the radial and the radial head are not bisecting the capitellum. So the management of these cases is orthopedic referral. For this case, internal fixation of the ulna was done by percutaneous key wires and the close reduction of the proximal uh, radius was done. If you see now, if you draw a line through the proximal radius and the radial head, that will bisect the capitella. So I'd like to remind you, Galeazzi fracture dislocation is fracture of the distal radius with dislocation of the distal radio ulnar joint.
Montegia fracture dislocation is a fracture of the ulna with dislocation of the proximal radio ulnar joint. By this, we concluded the common fractures of the upper extremity, and the next lecture will be common fracture of the lower extremity. Thank you very much.